Hello, Symposiast. Today's episode is the talk that I gave at the Scottish Pagan Conference in Glasgow in 2023. Before we dive in, allow me to remind you to sign up for my newsletter so that you can stay in touch with me. And please consider supporting my work with a one-off PayPal donation by joining my Inner Symposium on Patreon or Coffee. Super thanking me or checking out my services on my website, drangelapuka.com. So uh, welcome everybody to this talk on the historical misconceptions on paganism. And uh, thank you so much to the Scottish Pagan Federation for inviting me here and for the very warm welcome. And um, so today I will be talking about, uh, as I mentioned, the historical misconceptions in paganism. I'm Dr. Angela Puka. I'm a religious studies PhD uh, and uh, more specifically a pagan studies scholar. And in case you were not familiar with my work online, I'm also a digital academic or public scholar, as you could say, uh, because I have a social media project called Angela Symposium, where I disseminate peer-reviewed academic knowledge on topics in historicism, paganism, um, and all the magic practicing uh, religious traditions, <clears throat> we could say. So, um, the, some of the aspects of the, the things that I will be talking about in today's talk will be also found in specific episodes on my YouTube channel in case you, you would be interested in uh, deepening more the concepts that, I, that I'm going to talk about. So I will be mentioning five main misconceptions in uh, contemporary paganism, meaning in the, uh, within the practicing community, the, the pagan communities. And the first one that we're going to talk about is about the historicity of paganism. There is very often, uh, it's also called the ancient religion hypothesis, the idea that paganism uh, predates Christianity and the understanding that we have today of paganism uh, is that of a religion that has, uh, you know, has been dating back to before Christianity in a almost unchanging way. Uh, this is often called the ancient religion hypothesis, and it has uh, been uh, heavily disproven by historians. And it's not like there wasn't, <laughs> there weren't pagan religions in antiquity, uh, but it's more the claim that contemporary paganism and the way paganism is understood today dates back to before Christianity and dates back to those religions in an almost continuous lineage. This is a concept that dates back from uh, dates back to Renaissance and Enlightenment, and also the romanticized ideas of the past and of uh, pre-Christian times, but can be more clearly attributed to the, the the points that are the historical claims on which Wicca and contemporary paganism, which was in fact uh, born in the 20th century are based upon. So one of the key figures in spreading this kind of, this type of um, misconception, historical misconception is Margaret Murray, which probably some of you would be familiar with. And Margaret Murray was an Egyptologist and she was the one who claimed that um, there was this pre-Christian tradition that dates back from uh, before Christianity and that in an almost continuous line, albeit underground, kept almost secret and survived the advent and spread of Christianity. This is a claim that has been heavily disproven and to be fair, it was not particularly considered sound, not even in her own time. And this seems to be very much the case with a lot of the misconceptions that we will find. There are certain scholars that even in their own time where didn't particularly have the, the backing of the, the scholarly community, but those claims appeared to be particularly influential to the point where they determined and revealed to be very significant in the birth and spread of paganism. And, and this is one of the historical claims that you will still find uh, quite present in, within pagan communities, even though it has been largely disproven. Um, I will be mentioning a lot uh, Professor Ronald Hutton because he has written a lot about uh, these misconceptions. And uh, the, 
of course, there are other scholars as well that have talked about it, but Ronald Hutton tends to be the, the most known uh, pagan study scholar, we could say, uh, that has um, particularly worked on the history of paganism. So um, another misconception that we find in pagan communities is relates to the great witch hunt and what we could call pagan martyrdom. The idea that um, there is this popular myth that the burning times were a time where Christians persecuted pagans and persecuted witches who were pagans or would not really um, convert fully to Christianity or abide by what uh, Christian theology and Christian practice was uh, supposed to be. And there are a few misconceptions relating to the, to the witch hunt, some of which have to relate, relate to the numbers, because there is often the number of nine million witches that were burned at the, at the stakes or that were persecuted uh, because of witchcraft. And the numbers are more likely uh, between uh, 40,000 and 60,000, depend, you know, according to what the scholars and the scholarship say. say. These are the estimates. So, uh, this is, and this is what the historical records say. Another misconception about this is the fact that these were all pagans. And um, there's also a, a significant influence from the 1970s and feminist theology and feminist theory, which associated strictly uh, the idea of the burning times and the witches with um, feminism and in a way the persecution of witches became the persecution of women and that is also a little bit of a misconception because you also find that men were persecuted as well uh, during the witch hunts and uh, probably some of you will be also familiar with the fact that uh, it wasn't they weren't just witches I mean not only it, can it not be seen as a pagan martyrdom because it was not specifically necessarily pagans who were being persecuted and banned or uh, condemned to death. But um, it was much more complicated than that because the burning times had a lot of political affairs that came into, into place. And in some cases, people were condemned as witches just because they were politically inconvenient. <laughs> so in, in some cases, it had little to do with their religion to begin with. Um, so uh, you find that in pagan communities, at least I have seen that there is this sense of uh, reclamation of uh, being, being a pagan and being a witch in almost in opposition to, to Christianity. And I don't know if you've seen it online or in person, but um, there was this famous t-shirt that a lot of people would wear, uh, we are the granddaughters of the witches you couldn't burn, uh, which became also a meme online and on social media. And I think that that really encapsulates very well both the themes that we see in this misconception here, both the idea that uh, it was pagans and witches specifically that were persecuted during the witch hunts, and the idea that it was uh, primarily you know, a female persecution, uh, persecution of women. Uh, I think that in Italy in particular, we have very famous cases of uh, persecutions and burning at stake of uh, men, actually. Uh, the, the most famous that I can recall, who comes from the same place that I come from, the Neapolitan area in Italy, is Giordano Bruno, who was um, persecuted and um, burned in Campo dei Fiori in Rome and uh, he, was, he was a man, and there were quite a few um, persecuted uh, people that were sometimes not necessarily pagan, as I said, they were heretical, or in some other case, they were, they were just inconvenient <laughs> for the status quo and the politics of the time. So I would say this is another interesting, uh, interesting misconception to analyze. And also it's important to look, as I mentioned, uh, at the influence of feminist theology, and in particular at works like Witches, Midwives and Nurses by Barbara uh, Annenkerk and uh, Deidre English. So it's, it's very interesting to notice how things tend to be more nuanced than um, one can initially imagine. The third misconception that I wanted to talk about is, is the fact that Christian holidays have pagan origins. 
Uh, I think that in, in the past decade, at least from what I've seen in the vegan communities and online, there has been, and even in, in Italy, I've done research in Italy, but then I moved to the UK for my PhD. So I have uh, an understanding of, these, of both these countries and in terms of the pagan communities. So I've noticed that there has been a lot of trying of inform people of the idea, the concept that Christian holidays come actually from pagan holidays. And this is definitely a misconception. And we can find that um, looking at different festivals. I've recently published a video on my YouTube channel on Samhain, which disappointed a few people, which tends to be the case very often, especially when you talk about history. And um, one of the things that I think uh, some pagans were probably disappointed about is the fact that uh, I, I was saying in the video as the title that uh, Samhain was not a Celtic fire festival. And um, by that, I didn't mean that it was an Irish because some people seem to collate uh, Celtic and Irish, which is probably another misconception, uh, especially in certain areas of the world. So um, with Samhain, for instance, we have an example of how uh, both Christian holidays and pagan holidays influence each other. So Samhain was quite a complicated festival in the past, and the way we understand it now is heavily shaped by Wicca and contemporary paganism. But if we want to look at how Samhain was practiced in the past, we will find a lot of variety. So in some places it was not celebrated as a fire festival at all. In other places it was celebrated as a fire festival but with one meaning, in other places with another meaning. And over time, there was the influence, uh, this folk practice was absorbed elements of the Christian holiday, especially of the Christian holiday of All Souls. So the element of death, for instance, is something that was incorporated over time due to Christianity. So Samhain is one of those examples where we can see that, um, yes, there were pagan precursors, and it's important to distinguish when we talk about history between precursors and something coming directly from another thing historically. Uh, one thing is to find a direct link between two historical developments, one that comes first and the other that develops uh, as a result of it. And another thing is to find precursors. And precursors may be varied, and we start to have questions about why certain elements have become more influential than others, for instance. So when we look at Samhain and the way it is understood now in the pagan community, um, there is a specific selection of certain um, holiday, certain uh, practices around uh, the, that time of the year that are not representative of all the pagan or pre-Christian practices or non-Christian practices, like folk practices that were practiced across the, the British Isles and Ireland. So there was a specific selection that happened with Gerald Gardner and Wicca that then became particularly influential with the pagan community. Uh, but that's not representative of what happened in history. It's more representative of a recent development. And in any case, even in, in history, we see that um, Samhain or the other celebrations with different names that were uh, celebrated in the, around that time of the year were extremely varied. So you cannot really say that Samhain was a Celtic Fair Festival. And it's important also to acknowledge the fact that the association with the, um, with the dead and uh, the ancestors comes from the, the Christian influence of All Souls Day. There are, um, so one thing to understand when it comes to holidays, pagan holidays and their relation to Christian holidays, is the fact that in history we find very complex syncretism. Uh, and this happens not just in historical developments, but even nowadays, even in the present time, you will find that you go to a place and to another and the same festival, even if it is systematized, for instance, according to uh, the, the Wiccan tradition or another specific type of tradition, you will find that there are variations. And uh, when you don't even have a systematization, that is even more prevalent. So syncretism is something essential to bear in mind, that when it comes to the lived practices of people, 
you see that there's much more variation that you would imagine on what is written on paper. Um, this is true of all religions, even with Christianity, for instance, there are scholars who have talked about the difference between institutionalized religion and lived religion. And you will find that the way Christians um, conceptualize their own religion can vary significantly from the dogmatic understanding. This is even more prevalent with religions that don't have a central dogma like paganism. So it's important to understand that with the syncretism that happens with everything, and uh, of course also with religious and spiritual practices, you find that practices don't just simply come one from the other, but there is emerging overlap and also developments over time. So it's not as simple as saying this festival comes from uh, this other. I will give you uh, a couple of examples uh, other than uh, Samhain. There's also, for instance, the idea of um, Christmas and the idea that it comes from uh, the, um, the winter solstice or other pagan celebrations around that time of the year. It's still not particularly clear what the, um, when it comes to Christmas, how it came to be celebrated around on the 25th of December. There are still theories. But for instance, we find the theory by scholars such as uh, Stephen Hyman's, uh, where um, the, the idea of celebrating Christmas on the 25th of December was related to the idea of Jesus as the son of righteousness. Um, and this may or may not link to the idea with Sol Invictus, which was the celebration of the Romans. Uh, but uh, it's very, you cannot really say in a, it would be really an oversimplification to say, oh, there were these celebrations found around this time of the year, and then you have the, Christmas, the, the Christian celebration that happens around the same time of the year, so necessarily one comes from the other. Um, it is usually much more complicated than that, and even though it is uh, something historical that uh, Christian celebrations have influences from paganism and um, pre-Christian pagan celebrations, it's also true that contemporary pagan celebrations often have influence from Christianity. So, as I said, it tends to be, uh, an inf you know, that they influence each other. And I'm talking specifically about Christianity because my point of reference for talking about contemporary paganism is countries that have a strong uh, Christian influence. And so, since religions don't happen in a vacuum, they happen in a cultural context. If you, if a religion emerges and is practiced in a specific cultural context, it will be necessarily and unavoidably um, influenced by that context. Another case is Easter, for instance. Um, and Easter also represents complexities because it is often linked within the pagan community uh, to the Saxon goddess Eostre, uh, due to Jac Jacob Grimm's speculation of the 19th century. Um, however, this connection is contested, uh, contested and it is something that you will find uh, in Ronald Hutton's work, The Sessions of the Sun. Um, and you may know Jacob Grimm because he was one of the famous Grimm brothers and he was known for, they were known for the collection of fairy tales. And he was also a philologist and mythologist. And in the 19th century, he speculated about the existence of the worship of a pre-Christian deity named Eostre based on linguistic evidence and the etymology of the name of the festival of Easter. Um, Grimm's work sought to find parallels and origins of Germanic folklore and traditions in pre-Christian beliefs, um, in the pre-Christian beliefs of the Germanic people. So the, the book that I'm referring to, in which Grimm makes this connection, is uh, Deutsche Mythologie, or Teutonic uh, Mythology. And Grimm here hypothesizes that the Christian festival of Easter, celebrated in the spring, um, was named after Eostre, uh, whom he proposed was a Germanic goddess of dawn and spring. And he made connections between the name Eostre and the direction east as well, uh, as well as the German word Östern, uh, which is uh, Easter, basically. So the link was partially based on the similarities of the name to various Indo-European words for dawn and uh, spring season. 
Uh, this is actually a type of speculation that you, that you see a lot in the 19th century and 20th century. Uh, these speculations based on the Indo-European similarities in words, uh, which is not considered good scholarship nowadays. Uh, this connection is, however, highly contested because in reality, we only have one evidence of Eostre, and it comes from the Venerable Bede. And it's not even, you know, it's a, it's a very short mention that you will find in the, um, uh, in the work by Bede. And he claimed that the name for the month uh, of April was Eastern Monath and was named after a goddess Eostre. But uh, no other contemporary sources corroborate this, and there was also really a brief mention of that. So we don't really have much sound historical evidence to suggest the, the worship of Eostre. Um, so the, the, the concept that we have, in con that you find in contemporary pagan communities, is mostly based after Grimm's speculation. And it's interesting because you will find that um, poets and um, mythologists have influenced paganism quite a lot. And that is a nice segue into the fourth misconception, which is about the triple goddess. So the triple goddess, which is understood in contemporary paganism as the mother, mother crone archetype, has been mentioned in contemporary pagan communities as something very ancient, as something that um, if you look at the goddess from ancient times, you will find that you have lots of triple goddess and that the triple goddess is everywhere. And there's this concept of the universality of the triple goddess as something that you find across history. Uh, however, this is not corroborated by historical evidence. And in fact, the idea of the triple goddess as mother, mother and crone comes from Robert Graves and uh, his work, The White Goddess, which has been incredibly influential in contemporary paganism, and especially in the concept of the triple goddess, mother, mother, and crone. Um, even though you do find triple goddesses in, in history and in the pagan history and in pre-Christian or non-Christian times, they do not align with the concept of mother, maiden, mother, and crone. They are triple in other senses, not in mother, maiden, mother, and crone. This idea of associating the triplicity of the goddess to the stages of a woman's life is something that comes from Robert Graves. And Graves never, um, never really wanted to be a historian. In fact, if you look at the white goddess, uh, the subtitle, I think it's a uh, poetic myth, a history of poetic myth. So he was trying to, he was not particularly interested in historical facts. He was more interested in mythology and the power of, uh, the power of poetry and the power of myth to shape our reality. And we will talk about that later because after crushing all this, <laughs> the, the historical misconceptions, we can talk about the connection between uh, history and religious beliefs. So this concept also comes from, uh, from Graves, as I said, uh, which is a poet. So it's interesting how you have the idea of Eostre coming from Grimm, who was also passionate about fairy tales and mythology and the concept of the triple goddess coming from Robert Graves. Then we also have the idea of the primordial mother goddess, the concept of the mother goddess as this primordial goddess. Uh, and this is also a historical misconception that you find in paganism. And the narrative of a singular prehistoric mother goddess worshipped universally across Europe was most famously advanced by Maria Gimbutas, who interpreted archaeological findings as evidence of a widespread goddess culture. And this idea has been further romanticized and adopted within some strands of modern uh, paganism and feminist spirituality. However, it has faced considerable criticism uh, for its lack of corroborating evidence. Uh, you also have scholars like Bachofen, who initially posited the existence of matriarchal societies in prehistorical times, uh, but this also ha has also been challenged because there is no really there is no sound historical evidence uh, behind Bachofen's idea of. Ba Bachofen's was also very influential in the in the um, theoretical aspect and development of paganism because this idea that there was 
a matriarchal society before the patriarchal society um, corroborated the sense within pagan communities that going back to the goddess, going back to this primordial goddess was a way of going back to our roots, which is the theme of the, of the conference. Going back to our roots means going back to the ancient past. And what is the most ancient past? Well, according to Bakhoven, was matriarchy, matriarchal society. And that was then linked to the idea of this universal mother goddess. Um, but there is no historical evidence that we have a matriarchal society before the patriarchal ones. There are only um, very specific cases around the world, but no evidence that there was a widespread matriarchal society. Um, there are also other academics like Jacqueline Hawkes, who cautions against the projection of contemporary values onto um, ancient societies. I think that it's very interesting that um, even though the idea of this universal mother goddess was seen as something that corroborated feminist ide ideals in the beginning and uh, helped development of paganism uh, even in, the, um, in that kind of nuance, then it was later challenged by some scholars I've recently read the paper where the, the very concept of the mother goddess and it is contested by feminist scholars saying that um, very often goddesses are um, in a way simplified and only reduced to being mothers when in a lot of cases they were primarily other things. I mean, they were actually doing completely other things. And as one of the many, many, many things that they were known for, there was the idea of motherhood. But for some of the deities that even now we tend to think of as connected to motherhood, that's really not something that was very prevalent at all. And so that's been contested by feminist scholars because it's seen as actually something a bit more patriarchal, you know, the idea that the woman is only the mother. And so to have the, the, the female archetype, it needs to be connected to motherhood. And to have female goddesses, they need to be mother goddesses. Um, so, um, and this paper was also contesting the fact that this idea of the universal mother goddess was uh, postulated by male uh, scholars. I don't think that that's, uh, I don't, like ad hominem arguments where you say, oh, this is not a good um, argument because it comes from a person who is this gender or this identity. That's uh, an, a logical fallacy called ad hominem. Uh, but I was just presenting you with uh, what the paper said. Now, um, now that I have mentioned the historical <laughs> misconceptions, I think that it's important to also talk about the relation between history and myth and um, something that I've recently also talked on my YouTube channel, Angela's Symposium, the idea of mythopoesis. So one of the things that I've always been fascinated um, by in paganism is the fact that it doesn't, it's not as strict and dogmatic as other religions. Uh, however, in some cases, I have found this dogmatism, to be, to be fair. And um, I, one thing that I, I always like to stress is that even though certain things might not be historical, it doesn't mean that they are not valuable, and it doesn't mean that they don't have spiritual and religious significance for people. I think that it's actually very important to distinguish and disentangle the idea of something being historical and something being religiously valuable or um, religious, spiritually valid. There's the idea of something being valid that is part of the contemporary discourse, especially online. Um, and I don't think that that necessitates historical backing, to be honest, In, as long as there is a clear distinction between the two. There are other religions that tend to be more based on the idea that something is historical and that it is historical fact. I don't like to use the word truth when it comes to history because one, I think the truth is a metaphysical <laughs> statement. And two, because even with history, we find that evidence may change over time. Our understanding may change over time. We, we can have better methods or discover new evidence that may suggest something different from what we understand today. So what the historical facts suggest now for me is, for me, generally speaking, uh, what acad academics do and what we try to understand from a, a scientific and academic view is a, a, is a moving target. But 
My point is that it is important to understand what the history is. Don't pretend that something is historical when it is not, just to validate a practice. And to understand that spiritual and religious practices have value in themselves, because if they are transformative for the individual, if they contribute to the process of meaning making and belief making, and are, as I said, transformative or effective in any shape or form, I don't think that they need to have historical backing. And I don't think that people need to pretend that they have historical backing to, to feel like those concepts are valid and valuable. The value is in the transformative experience that the person has via the adoption of that um, belief. So for instance, the concept of the triple goddess is not historical, it's not something that we really find in history, but it's something that has been incredibly impactful and transformative to so many people. So does it mean that the fact that it doesn't hold up to the historical scrutiny, does it devaluate it? I would say no. The only thing that I would say as a pagan studies scholar and academic is that it is important to maintain the difference between the two. Another occurrence where I find this to happen very often is with a concept that you find in different spiritual and religious movements nowadays, including paganism, which is the idea of perennialism. Perennialism is the idea that um, there is one underlying truth one truth that underlies all the different religions and all the different traditions and all the different cultures, that there is one kernel of truth that can be found and all the cultural specificities are more like a, an overlay. But the truth underneath it is shared across them all. This is a perennialist view. Now, this perennialist view is found in paganism when we talk, for instance, in Wicca and other contemporary pagan traditions, that all gods are one god and all goddesses are one goddess. And um, also the, the idea of wanting to find parallels between goddesses or gods that have different cultural backgrounds, different histories, and claim that those are the same entity. Now, I will make, you, I will make a practical example to uh, explain what I mean when I say that it's important to value religious experiences in themselves and not claim historicity where what is happening is a religious and a spiritual experience. So I've explained to you what perennialism is. I can tell you that in academia, perennialism is not something that is not a methodology that you can use to study things because uh, a practitioner, a, a pagan or a spiritual practitioner may want to find similarities and unifications, whereas academics are very much concerned with specificities. And um, it's not, for an academic, it's not enough to find similarities and discard the differences, which is something that may happen uh, with a perennialist view, to overlook the differences and the cultural specificities and focus more on the similarities, to say, oh, um, there's Angela, who's a woman, another woman who has dark hair. They come from Italy. They are the same person. And it is discarding all the, the, the differences between me and this other, this other woman that may have some similarities with me. So academics tend to focus a lot on the complexity and the nuance and the context. So the context cannot be dis discarded. With uh, practitioners instead, their focus may not be to gather the most accurate knowledge about a specific deity and a specific cause at a specific time. For a practitioner, what might be more important is to have a connection with a specific energy, with that goddess. So what happens if uh, you are a pagan, you have um, a spiritual transformative practice where you have the experience that Artemis and Hecate appear to you in a vision and they say, I am one goddess, I am your goddess, I'm here to, to help you. What does it mean? Is that, does it mean that, the, um, that Artemis and Hecate are the same deity in history? No. And does it mean that the fact that this is not historically factual, does it in any way undermine that spiritual transformative experience? Also, no. The problem only starts when the person who has this spiritual experience, and rightfully so, gives a lot of importance to it, then starts to cherry pick 
history and starts to write books and write blogs and disseminate online or disseminate in person the concept that actually Hecate and Artemis are the same exact goddess because look at all these similarities and just forget about all the differences because look at the similarities. So I guess that with this example, what I'm trying to illustrate is that um, spiritual and religious practices are extremely important. And as an anthropologist, of course, I do participant observation. I participate in rituals. I undertake initiations. So I see how much practices mean to people. And I would never, never, I would never ever uh, undermine uh, any of that. The only thing that I really want to try to encourage pagans to do is to not claim historicity when historicity is not there just for the sake of validation. Because your practice is valid in itself. If it is important to you, if it is transformative to you, if it has meaning to you, then it is valid. You don't need to have any historical validation for that. And it's important to maintain the distinction because we need both. We need the historical perspective and we need the facts. And we also need the spiritual experiences, the way they come, and um, see them as valid and potent and transformative as they are and as they appear. So I think that I can end here and uh, thank you. <laughs>